Great. Well, um, so for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Meg Kilcoyne, um, and I'm running for state representative. Uh, I am uh, grew up in the district. My family's from here. Um, I grew up in Sterling. My family's from Clinton. Um, and I've spent the last 10 years being able to continue to serve all six towns in the district as uh, state representative Harold Naughton's uh, legislative director, uh, who is currently the incumbent state representative. Um, I'm excited to, I'm running because, you know, these are communities that I care deeply about, um, communities that I've had the honor of serving for 10 years. And I was really excited to take this opportunity to try to run myself to not just continue serving these towns, but be able, being able to bring my own vision um, and my own um, ideas to try to better our neighborhoods, our towns, as well as the Commonwealth as a whole. Um, you know, I've, I've had, I think that I'm able to bring a lot of experience in the legislature to the table, um, which I think is going to be incredibly important going forward as I'm sure all of you are aware we're facing unprecedented um, challenges, um, both with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the public health crisis that that's caused, in addition to the economic upheaval, um, and as well as uh, you know we're facing challenges every day as we're seeing this past week uh, with the uh, tragic murder of George Floyd. Um, and so I hope to bring the experience that I have in the legislature to hit the ground running to try to make sure that we're doing everything we can to promote policies that are going to help everybody. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot we need to do to continue some of the progress we were making before the pandem pandemic, for example, uh, education. Um, you know, we recently passed the Student Opportunity Act to bring in, uh, I think, two billion more in our at schools. Um, and we're going to have to continue, you know, fighting for that as now we're seeing that those revenue streams are very uncertain. Um, and, uh, you know, trying to continue bringing economic development to our areas. Um, you know, I've had the ability to be able to take part in advocacy for local funding for each of our communities. Um, for instance, in the town of Berlin, you know, I, I was able to be fortunate enough to help advocate for various funding, such as um, the old church in the town and the community garden. In. Um, so I hope to kind of continue, you know, as we go forward, um, as you know, continuing to fight for budget priorities, which will be a challenge given this current crisis. Um, and then hopefully advocate for policies that I feel are going to better enable, um, broad, better enable every citizen in the Commonwealth to kind of raise their families and live here comfortably, like access to health care. Um, you know, addressing issues concerning climate change and the environment um, and, you know, uh, so many other issues that I think are important to building up our communities and our constituents' lives. Um, and so that's kind of, in general, what and why I'm running. You know, I'm, I, I think that it's, it's being in the legislature can bring so much good to the Commonwealth. And so I hope to have the honor to continue serving our towns and, and keep working hard for everybody here. Okay. Um, questions? Uh, so. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, I was just wondering, you mentioned your experience uh, in legislate, legislature. Um, was that working with Norton? Norton? Yeah. So um, I, I'll expand on that a little bit. Um, and I apologies. Sometimes I try to I talk a little fast. Uh, so if anybody needs me to slow down, please let me know. Um, so yeah, I started working for Representative Norton about ten years ago um, as his legislative director. So in that capacity, I uh, both was responsible for uh, making sure that his the bills that he filed in the legislature got passed. Um, making sure that the budget priorities we had were able to get into the annual state budget. Um, and I also oversaw committee legislation. Um, he has chaired the public safety committee for about the last 10 years. So in each of those areas, I sort of got to oversee all of those policies. So I got to take part in a lot of um, really, really great stuff that, uh, that we did both locally and statewide. So you know, some bills that we worked on, for example, locally, um, you know, we uh, recently, I think 2018 for the town of Berlin, actually, um, you know, each town, as I'm sure you guys are aware, they can vote on special legislation to have their legislators file that we then take at the state house, we file it statewide. 
um, and then make sure it gets passed in the legislature. So an example for the town of Berlin, um, you know, they were the Board of Selectmen had voted to change the structure of their local government to include a town administrator. So we were able to work with the town, work with the various office in the legislature to try to get that passed to enable the town to restructure the govern uh, their government that way. Um, for an example of the, of the work I did with the Public Safety Committee um, two years ago, you know, you, you see about 300 various bills that are assigned to the committee and they deal with a wide array of issues uh, pertaining to public safety. So we get about 300 bills every year. So the, in my capacity as legislative director, my job was to put on hearings um, for the public to come in and voice their opposition or support um, and to uh, you know, work with the legislators or the members of the committee to, to decide what was reported out favorably and, and what would go on to the next, pro le pro uh, the next step in the legislative process. So, um, you know, an example of a bill I got to work on to the end that was signed into law uh, about two years ago, the uh, red flag law, as it's most commonly known, it's extreme risk protection orders. So that's actually um, uh, a, 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 a bill that gained a lot of momentum after the Parkland shooting of 2018. Um, and it would be a bill that would uh, allow uh, family members or law enforcement officers to uh, petition the judge to get a... Um, their firearm license revoked if they prove to be a risk to themselves or the public. Um, and that was an issue that um, many cited as a priority to try to make sure that we were doing what we could as a state to make sure firearms were not in the hands of anybody uh, dangerous. Um, so I guess long answer to your story is, is so sort of my job was, was making sure that every step of the process that we were doing everything we can to get a bill from uh, that was filed to, to landing on the governor's desk to be signed into law and working with different stakeholders and partners to try to make that happen. Thank you. James? Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Megan. Um, Hi. So I just had one quick question. I'm asking it of pretty much every candidate in Central Mass. Um, in light of everything that's been going on this past couple of weeks um, in Minnesota and in uh, just most recently in Worcester, I was wondering if um, you could tell us uh, what does what does racial justice mean to you going forward? Yeah, um, I think that's a really great question and one that I've been asking myself a lot over the last couple of weeks as well. I know personally, I've always tried to support causes um, that that seek to eradicate uh, racism, policies that would, you know, bring, try to bring greater racial justice. But I think what I'm realizing in the last two weeks is that everybody has to kind of take a step back and think about how we, how both the current system, you know, you know, I'm a white woman, you know, I, I have privilege that goes with that and what ways I'm complicit in the system as it currently stands um, in perpetuating syst systemic racism. Um, I think going forward, we all have to take a look at policies that maybe we weren't talking about before and bring more accountability both to not just the police force, but just in all facets of, of what where we're looking at. I think we need to start with looking at ways in which we can hold, you know, members of the police more accountable uh, because clearly we're seeing nationwide that there's disturbing trends amongst uh, use of force, especially as it pertains to Black Americans. Um, you know, I, I know that there was a bill that I think was reported out of the Public Safety Committee that I worked on that dealt with um, peace officer. It's a peace off, it's a training bill, but it would try to create better training standards across the board for different law enforcement um, communities. I don't know if, did you see the press conference that was at the State House this morning? Um, there was a event with members, black and Latino members of the legislature that cited policies that um, might, we should start looking about, looking at and talking about to try to work towards ending racism in our own state. That was one of them. Um, and then there's other bills that, you know, I, I don't know if they're gonna continue this session, but, you know, looking at uh, ways we can make sure, you know, if there's a shooting that occurs amongst the police officer, are we finding out what's going to happen? Um, making sure there's accountability if there's complaints or incidents and things like that. Um, 
you know, I, I, I don't know what the answers are right now, but I know that I think the first step is seeking ways in which, you know, I'm aware of what ways I'm perpetuating racism and what then needs, then the next step is listening to those affected, listening to leaders, um, you know, in the racial justice movement, being open and being open to new ideas that maybe we haven't uh, discussed before and looking at policies that can actually bring results sooner rather than later. Does anyone else have a question or should I start going off my list here? Bob's trying to speak. Can Bob's I, trying to speak. I can ask him one more to keep the microphone. So. Bob, you need to unmute yourself. I don't know how to help him do that. <laughs> huh? You should have a, a signal that says, or you can go down at the bottom. Uh, go down at the right. bottom of your screen. Go. Uh, yeah, I have. We got him. Okay. All right. Do you have a question for Meg? Not at the moment. I may. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we thought you did. All right. Um, Piper's not on here, so I'm going to ask you. Um, how do you feel about the transparency in the legislature and have you signed this transparency pledge? So, I mean, I think that there, are, I'm sure as you know, Massachusetts is not really great when it comes to transparency and compared to other ones. Um, I think that there's definitely steps that can be taken to help both, you know, the public be more aware of what's going on. Um, uh, you know, like for instance, California, I think they publish all their bill summaries for the public to read, which I think would be help not just to the public, but I think some of the staff members at the state house as well. Um, I have not yet signed the transparency pledge, but I'm certainly looking at it. Um, you know, I think I, I, I know that uh, it's a pledge that I believe would deal with committee votes, correct? And how mm -hmm. they're- uh, It would help us public. to know that whoever, you know, whoever gets this job, it would help us to know better what they're actually doing behind yeah. the doors. Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking at that pledge now. I mean, I'm still, it's still kind of early in, in my campaign, but um, I know I can say that it's something that I always wanna be accessible and accountable to the people I'm serving. I want them to know where I stand on issues and what votes I've taken. Um, you know, I, it's, it's something I'm still familiarizing myself, but I think it's obviously, if it's if it's important to the constituents then it's important to me too and you know i i will get back to you when i actually if i actually do sign it but it's okay. just trying to familiarize myself with some of the things that are coming out i know the transparency pledge is somewhat i think it started what like two years ago and there's a handful of legislators that are on it now um but um but yeah i think transparency is important i think we can do better and you know i, I definitely am interested in looking at ways the transparency pledge can can facilitate that Okay, because there's a lot of resistance to those who've been in there for a long time to this kind of change. But, you know, I think it's important that folks in that position remember that they work for their constituents and, you know, we should know what choices that they're making. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, a, a huge portion of our budget in Berlin is healthcare. Um, how would you, how would you help communities in your district with healthcare? Where do you stand on, on that issue? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, healthcare is a huge, I think, uh, you know, it takes up, I know, a huge portion of local budget and state budget. And I think that we have to do what we can to try to alleviate the costs on local municipalities. Uh, but we also have to commit ourselves to making sure that we're continuing to expand health. I think healthcare access is super, you know, a, a huge priority of mine, making sure that everybody has access to affordable healthcare. Um, to alleviate costs on municipalities, I think that, you know, we have to do more to uh, make sure that healthcare costs are, uh, you know, I think I think we have to make sure that we're. I would support policies or any policy policies out there that are both expanding access as well as doing more to address costs for towns and and cities and towns. Um, you know, I I'm open to legislation that would do that. Although I do think it's important that 
whatever we do, we make sure that we're continuing to make sure that every citizen has access to healthcare and that we're doing what we, I think we're at like 97% coverage right now, but we absolutely need to continue that. And I think we're seeing with COVID-19, um, making sure, you know, we're seeing huge levels of unemployment. We're gonna see huge increases on those that are go, going on mass health. Um, and I think we have to start looking at ways that we're making sure that, you know, currently our healthcare is tied to employment maybe we have to start looking at other ways to address the healthcare crisis to make sure that everybody has healthcare and we're not placing that burden directly on, on local municipalities. What can we do at the state level to sort of alleviate those pressures? Okay. Um, climate change. Talk about solutions to climate change. Yeah, um, I think that obviously this is an issue that is not going to go away. This is an issue that we're gonna be living with, you know, I'll be living with for if we don't act now, that could get exponentially worse for generations forward, including my lifetime. Um, I think there's a lot of great bills in the House right now, uh, in the legislature, I should say, that we have to continue to support, um, you know, making sure we're, we're reducing carbon emissions. Um, you know, I think a big issue that I am really interested in is the concept of um, environmental justice. Uh, there's a lot of ways in which, uh, uh, demog uh, social and economic disparities impact the, in the effects of climate change. So for instance, you know, people that um, live in lower income communities tend to be uh, more exposed to things like hazardous waste or, uh, you know, flooding or other damages for climate change. So I think it's, you know, you have to have to look at it as a collective level and make sure that we're addressing climate change in a way that's going to bring more equity and, uh, you know, understand that if we don't act, there's, there's members of our community and, and society that are going to be disproportionately affected. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of um, bills, there's a lot of policies out there such as um, carbon pricing, uh, environmental justice, um, you know, organizations such as the Sierra Club do do a great job at, at promoting certain bills that are out there to try to uh, make sure that your there's your understanding of the, of the bills what can be what are ones that are actually going to kind of address this issue in a way that is you know across the board um, lowering our energy emissions and uh, uh, you know other areas where we're addressing climate change in an effective way. Okay. Um, transportation. Obviously, we have a problem with public transportation out here and our highways keep getting busier and busier. Um. Yeah, um, I think we're also in a unique area. You know, our, our district is not one that I think has great access to public tra transportation um, options. I know for myself, like I often, you know, I've had to commute from this area to Boston regularly and you really only have two commuter rails um, that are available to you, one in Lemonster or Worcester. Um, and those don't always run on a reliable schedule either. Um, I think we need to do better at making sure that those of us out here have access to effective and reliable and efficient public transportation that also would actually go far in, in addressing certain carbon emissions from cars that are on the highway. I'm sure as many of you experienced, the Mass Pike or Route 2 can get so jammed with traffic that you can be, you know, it can take anywhere from like two hours or more to get down into the city. Um, I think, you know, another problem is, is speaking of Route 2, that is a major highway, a major access to the eastern part of the state, but is still, you know, not really conducive to the amount of traffic that it holds. So we have to find ways to either improve that, those routes to facilitate more, you know, better access or improve the public transit options that we have to alleviate traffic that are on those routes as well. Um, you know, we did, I know that there was um, an investment the legislature did on trying to improve some of our bridges, some of our roads. That's another thing we're going to have to fight for given um, COVID-19 that are going on because there's so many areas locally too where our roads just need so improvement desperately to the point where, you know, it could even be damaging to cars. I mean, there's some potholes in some of the streets that are just awful. A lot of our bridges in the Commonwealth are, are really not really up to where they need to be. I think, you know, something like 
half of them are, are in desperate need of repair. So we, transportation is an issue that we need to, you know, invest to make sure that we're not uh, neglecting our, car, our, our local roads and our, our bridges and, and continue to find ways to facilitate better access to, um, you know, Boston and other c cities. So if people are, people have uh, um, options to commute to their jobs that are available to them. Bob, you had a question? Yes, predatory lending. I'm not sure what bills are in the, legis uh, in the works in the legislature now. There have been bills in the past. I would hope there are some with a hope of passing this year, but predatory lenders have a nasty way of sucking the life out of people of some frequently of low means uh, right here yeah. in Burton. And I'm wondering what legislature you're from, uh, legislation you're familiar with uh, now that could be pushed to uh, correct that injustice? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, off the top of my head, I, I can't name specific bills. I know it's an issue that gets talked about a lot at Beacon Hill with predatory lenders. I could certainly find specifics for you and get back to you later um, at what certain bills are filed right now, what's currently moving. Um, I know it's an issue that uh, many communities are facing with, um, including ours, um, and including probably all over the Commonwealth. And it's, it's something that we have to make sure like vulnerable people are not subject to, to those types of, um, scam scams. So, uh, I don't have a specific bill for you right now, but I can, you know, if you want to, we can offline chat about it more. Cause I, I could easily, I mean, one thing you learn quickly in the leg legislature, there's about 5,000, sometimes 8,000 bills that are filed every year covering all different areas. Um, a key thing I've found is that when you're working in the building or, or legislator or staff, you need to know, you know, how to find out information quickly, who's working on what issues, what committees have jurisdiction to figure out what bills are filed. Um, predatory lending would probably be something I would guess would be under the Financial Services Committee. Um, uh, possibly possibly consumer protection. That might actually be where it's at. But, um, and if you, you know, the important thing about being a legislator is you can't always know every single bill, but you have to know how to find out what it is. So I'd happy to get a list of different bills that are kind of kicking around that are dealing with this and, and kind of tell you where they are and, and where they are in the process right now. Do you see any resistance in the legislature to passing really stiff regulations concerning predatory um, lending? Again, I'm not, sorry, I'm just turning on, starting getting a little dark in here. I am not too familiar with the specific issues that are, or certain what legislators might be against it or um, what might be holding it up. I do know that with every bill right now, um, obviously the COVID-19 crisis has kind of thrown the legislative process for a bit of a loop. Sure. They're still working on getting full formal sessions up and running. I'm hopeful that soon they'll be able to look at different policy issues that were kind of getting momentum before this happened so they can kind of continue addressing some of these important situations. Um, for predatory lending, you know, I don't, I can't speak to the specifics of why it hasn't passed, but again, that's something I could try to get some more insight for you if you wanted to chat offline at some other point. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Barbara? Uh, yeah, me? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, I was just wondering um, how she felt about single payer. She didn't mention single payer. Single payer healthcare? Healthcare, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that single payer is something that we should probably start talking about more seriously as an option for healthcare. I'm, you know, I wouldn't consider myself an expert on on healthcare plans. I do know that we have to do better. I mean, we're, we are one of the probably most expensive countries in the world in terms of how much healthcare costs and still have failed to figure out a way to adequately cover everybody. Um, and kind of alluding to my point earlier, I think we're now seeing the vulnerabilities of having insurance tied directly to your employment situation. Um, I think single payer the problem of that. <laughs> yeah, I you know exactly. So single payer actually is a way that we could we could look at to reduce 
um, those anxieties and alleviate some of the pressure on um, employer uh, on whether or not you're going to get covered. Um, and I think we're seeing that now. I mean, it's something that now I, I five years ago you didn't hear many Dem mean, like Democrats talk about it. And now it's something that presidential candidates are talking about in a way that is gaining momentum. So I certainly would support um, you know looking to see if we can implement something like that at the state level. Thank you. Anybody else with a question out there? Okay, um, not yet. I'll tell you when to bring it. Um, what, um, can you speak briefly about voting reforms and your feelings on things like ranked choice voting and voting by mail and um, especially with COVID, these, these yeah. things are really coming to the forefront. Yeah, I think that, um, I think that we're gonna have to look at probably trying, hopefully implementing more robust voting by mail um, soon. I think that we're seeing that we sh nobody should feel at risk for their lives or their health to go vote. Um, we have to make sure that everybody can vote safely. I think that tomorrow actually there, there should be, the House is voting on, on a, vote, a bill that should facilitate voting by mail um, for the elections in the fall. Um, and I think some of the town elections. So I, I absolutely think that we need to make sure that people, that it's easier, it's easy, easy for people to vote and safe for people to vote. And I think mail voting is a way to do that. I think um, ranked choice voting, I think it's been successfully implemented in the state of Maine um, after their experience with some of the, um, their governor races. Um, I think it's a great way to, you know, I, I would certainly not be opposed to it. Um, and I would certainly support it because I think it can be a way, you know, for people to be able to express their their choices for candidates in a way that um, will make sure that you're not, you know, if you have two great candidates, maybe that are sort of somewhat similar on their issues, voting for one's not going to completely cancel out the other or lead to a result where, you know, you're not really getting what your your actual position is. So. Um, it's definitely something that I, I would be open to. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, now, if uh, nobody else has any questions, um, is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we head on to the next candidate? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys all for letting me come talk to you. Um, it was great to hear from everybody. Um, I know that, you know, going forward, if anybody wants to talk to me more about any issues that we discussed tonight or any other uh, policies that are important to you, I'd be happy to chat more. Um, and, uh, you know, and if there's anything else that you want to learn about me, please feel free. I have a website, um, megkillcoin.org. Please feel free to visit that or follow me on Facebook. Um, and again, it was great meeting you all, and I hope to hear from you soon. And I hope you have a great evening and hope that everybody's staying safe. All right. Thank you so much, Meg, and have a good evening. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Have a good one.